Mark Yassin is the winner of the 1998 Nobel Prize in Economics. He was given the award for, quote, restoring an ethical dimension to the discussion of economic problems. His writings have revolutionized the theory of development by focusing on the importance of freedom over wealth. In his new book, Development as Freedom, he allows economics to address the social basis of the well-being of the individual. I am pleased to have him on this broadcast, as we always are, to have someone here who brings uh, piercing insight into issues that are part of not only the discussion in the United States, but the world. Welcome. To Thank this you very broadcast. much. This notion of how you feel about markets and democracy and how you feel about growth economics working best in an economic environment that is, in, in a political environment that's a democracy or a political environment that is a totalitarian state? Yes, uh, well, I think what I like to think of um, in, in this context is to go a bit behind the institutions. And the main approach, which actually the book actually also does pursue, is that the, the very basic thing which leads to social change and progress is ultimately individual freedom. But individual freedom, of course, is also um, conditional on certain social opportunities being available, political opportunities, economic opportunities. And my claim is that, that uh, the freedoms of different kinds complement each other. Just as I was mentioning in the case of the riots, uh, communal riots, right. the people didn't have economic freedom, had to go into hostile area and got killed. So uh, economic freedom gives you more uh, liberty there also. Similarly, uh, I think political freedom gives voice, democracy, civil rights, uh, open media, uh, public discussion like we are having yeah. now, gives, the, gives voice to the people who are deprived. And, and, and you make the point, well taken it seems, that at a time of a famine, a democracy is more likely to put a break yes. on a famine than a totalitarian state. It's not only more likely, that's radically so. There has never been a famine in a democratic country, even very poor ones, like Zimbabwe, Botswana, India. India continues to have famine, right up to independence, which is the last one that occurred, which I saw as a child I was mentioning. Yeah. But if you and look at the famines the, today, they're all in countries that are totalitarian. Well, if you think of North Korea, Sudan, if you think of the past, the biggest famine in recorded history, China, 58, 61, 30 million people dead. Soviet Union in, in the 1930s, military dictatorship one kind or another, Ethiopia, Somalia, you know, right. Mozambique, uh, Angola, one, one after another. And it happens because in a democracy, the protest, the public voice would not allow and, and tolerate. Yeah, I, I would say that there are two things, that you may be very lucky and may have no democracy and still have no famine, but if a famine were to develop, democracy provides a guarantee for stopping it because famines are extremely easy to stop and this was one of my earlier works I did a book published in 1981 called Poverty and Famine showing why famines occur because of really decline on the fortunes of a very small group of people maybe millions but still proportionately very small and you can very easily stop it even without getting any kind of assistance from abroad and if a government has an incentive to do it, it can always stop a famine extremely easily. So that led to the second part. How can part. it do it if it has an incentive? Uh, well, if it doesn't have an incentive, then it couldn't do it. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying that if it did have an incentive to do it, then it can carry it out very easily. So the economic analysis led me to the political one, and it was quite clear that in a democracy, if you have to fight another election, and not like being criticized by opposition parties, and not like being hoisted up by newspapers and the media, you would actually do something about preventing famines, and that's extremely easy to do. And, and that's why, you know, even though China was in many ways doing better than India right from the beginning, from the middle of the century, nevertheless, um, India was much better able to stop famine than China, because when the famine occurred and about 10 million people were dying in China each year through, the, through that period after the Great Leap Forward failed, the there was no, no criticism of the government. There was, in fact, no news coverage of the famine at all. People didn't even know that people were dying in such numbers. We now know from demographic statistics of the Chinese themselves. Another aspect of this, obviously, which you have talked about and written about, is whether uh, you look at Singapore as one example yes. uh, of an economic growth yes. 
and a different political structure. And then you look at some democracies, uh, likewise, in Africa, where the most progressive economic growth is taking place in a democratic establishment. Like Botswana, yes. So what rule do we bring out of that? Yeah. I think, you know, those who have studied these kind of issues, like Robert Barrow, my old colleague from Harvard, and others, uh, Przewski, uh, Limogi, and others, find that actually, as far as economic growth is concerned, there is no connection one way or the other very much about democracy. It's much more concerned with the friendliness of the economic climate rather than harshness of the political climate. But if you go beyond economic growth and think of development in terms of human security, um, then I think democracy has a role. I mean, one good example would be that East Asian, uh, South Korea or, um, or Indonesia, uh, Thailand, Southeast Asia, they were all doing terribly well and people somehow didn't miss democracy at that time when everything seemed to be going up and up together. But of course when the crisis came, divided the fell. And when that happened, the lack of voice of the underdog, uh, because in the absence of a democracy, were badly felt. And naturally in South Korea and Indonesia, these became the big moments of democratic movement, and not surprisingly at all. Explain this to me, and you will understand this much better, and I've never quite understood the reasons why. Here in this United States, we have a booming stock market. We're creating enormous wealth for a certain percentage of people. Uh, the notion is that the rising tide raises all boats, yet we have a growing disparity yes. between wealthy and poor, yes. an income inequality. How is that possible? Charlie, can I go beyond that? Too? Yes. That not only income inequality, that could be bad enough, but I think that's not where the real problem is. The real problem is the inequality of basic freedom to live in a way that you would like to live. And that includes living long, living uh, a life without illnesses, living in a peaceful, happy surrounding, and so on. And if you think about that, you see the lack of health care in the United States, the lack of insurance about health care, despite the, the richness of the country. I mean, it's coming back to the political discussion right now. It's actually it's really scandalous, uh, you know, whether 43 million people not having medical insurance, whether that's an exaggeration or not. Certainly, a very large number of people are. And sometimes it's our good, but in fact, it doesn't make any difference. But if you look at the mortality differences between different regions of, uh, of, of the country and between different classes and between different races, African-Americans, for example, as a group, have a lower chance of reaching any kind of age beyond 15 than the Chinese or the Indians in Kerala or Sri Lankans and so on. And why is that? Well, I think to, to some extent, uh, lack of medical insurance plays a part educational failure plays a part. And sometimes it's thought that this is all connected with violence, and indeed death from violence is high, and that's also a social malaise. And family structure and lots of other things. All sorts of things. But actually, I, but in the book I study and go beyond that, even if you take beyond age of 35, when death from violence is no longer a factor. And look at women. You see similar deprivation. And you know, the overall impact is just radically different from what the picture on income comparison would look like. That is, if you take, say, African-American, it's quite often said African Americans are relatively deprived, deprived compared with American whites, but they're not absolutely deprived, nor are they relatively deprived compared to the third world. Now that's true in, in terms of income. They may have income 30, 40 times the Chinese or the Indian. On the other hand, the life expectancy of African Americans in this city, in New York, or in San Francisco, or in Washington, is several years lower than that in India or Pakistan on an average. And if you took the those... Life expectancy in the inner city of New York, in many cases, is lower than that of... African-American, uh, I'm talking about. No, 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 male African -American, American in the inner city, primarily. Yeah. And the male African-American uh, rates are uh, very low, like 58 years. And that's uh, dramatically uh, low in comparison with income. And you have to ask the question, what's gone wrong? And I think here, it's not just a question of having a democracy, but also what kind of issues could be forcefully practiced. That's why I'm so delighted that to some extent this issue is returning back into American electoral politics. Because without that, we won't have any, any change, really, 
because I think the... Wait, let me interrupt you. What's the evidence that's in, in it reintroducing itself into well, American politics? I, I, I didn't probably just a <laughs> victory of hope over experience. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I thought that, uh, that uh, in the discussion of both Gore and Bradley, it's at uh, least... You're right, it is. And Senator Bradley is trying to raise... I mean, Senator former Senator Bradley, Bradley is trying I, to raise I, this I, as I an issue. I meeting at one right. occasion, I must say, I greatly admired him. I think it's wonderful if you can bring those uh, issues into the story. But, you know, each area, it, it's peculiar. I think in Europe, you could not have survived with the kind of health care situation. No government would have the chance of winning an election. All right, Mr. but that's Tan what I want to get at, too, because for a second, if, uh, mm. you know, if you look at the economics and the reality of health care and those kinds of numbers rather than income inequality, it's much more dramatic and blatant and, and, and uh, powerful yeah. as a condition. Why do you think, even though your expertise and your scholarly work is economics and not politics, why do you think the body politic allows that in this country? Because I would like to believe, naively, that we are a good people who care about yeah. our neighbors. Well, I think that's an extremely interesting question. And you're quite right. As an economist, I hesitate to speak on it. So, uh, but I must say the political analysis of it requires to go much deeper into this because there are peculiar arbitrariness. In America, you can get by without health insurance being a political issue in the way you can't in Europe. In Europe, you can get by with double-digit unemployment levels, which no U.S. government could have survived on. Mm -hmm. In India, you cannot afford to have a famine, but you can survive with a regular undernourishment of a kind, which is very peculiarly strong. So you could get away with uh, you could get and you change it. You could get away in India on gender inequality. It wasn't politicized, but thanks to the feminist movements and others now, and a, and a general political change, uh, women's, in, uh, women's inequality has become a big politicized issue. So I think it's a question of really the opportunity of the political leadership and the vision of the political leadership to seize some of these issues. And I think if the medical care issue is strongly. Uh, politicized, I think you'd get the kind of response that you would get in Europe. And that's why I remain ultimately very hopeful on that. But you can't really do a sudden change without at the same time affecting public opinion and public discussion. Uh, it, and then you can get to the interesting debate how to do something about it. That's I mean, right. And therefore, um, you know, honorable people can differ over how to treat the illness, but once they got to make a commitment that there ought to be, it's unacceptable. Yes in terms of health care, in terms of education, in terms of children's nutrition, in yes. terms of all those things that affect life yes. expectancy. Yes, oh, absolutely. And, and I think there's no substitute to having active public discussion. I mean, so far as my book is trying to do yeah. anything, it's trying to draw public attention to certain, you know, certain things which we do know on the basis of economic, political, social analysis. And it's bearing, and development is interpreted here very widely. It applies to America, it applies to Europe, as well as to India and China and Africa and Latin America. So it's really, in some ways, the centrality of public discussion, which is really the main thing that the book is trying to present in terms of identify the various kinds of unfreedom. It could be political unfreedom, it could be social opportunity unfreedom, and so on. Development as freedom. There are many people I know who I respect and admire for their achievements who believe that Freedom and free markets are one and the same thing. I think that's just nonsense. I mean, free markets are quite an important contribution to, 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 to development. I mean, even somebody like Karl Marx in the capital thought that the, that the civil, American Civil War was the most important event of his, of his time on grounds that it good pe got people out of slavery into a market economy, into right. a wage economy. And yet, uh, you need to supplement the market economy by so many other things, democracy, public expenditure. Great guru of market economy, Adam Smith, goes on and on on the need for public education, uh, need for poverty relief, in fact. So I think in many ways, it's, one has to place the market economy as one institutional aspect of a multi-institutional world. And anyone who wants to identify free market with freedom is as mistaken as someone who would take the view that you can dispense with market uh, in, a, in, in, in the pursuit of freedom. You need to see it in a, in a much wider context. I, I, I fear asking this, but I'm tempted to anyway, and generally I follow temptation. Uh, what's the best idea you ever had? 
Oh, good God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think probably some of the, some of the ideas that I would be more pleased with are rather more technical than easy to discuss. The, you know, I, I mentioned that the novella was connected with social choice theory. Or there were issues of aggregation and so on. And there were these. Kenneth Arrow had an impossibility right. theorem showing right, why sure, you cannot right. and majority right. decision lead to inconsistencies. Right. And really the hard work to a great extent was how you can broaden the informational input into the social analysis. I think to some extent that has played a part in all these things. The need to have a much wider informational structure, to know much more, not just one small thing, not just income, but also how people's lives go, their, their longevity, their health care, their educational arrangement. These turn out to be quite crucial in both the technical mathematical problems in dealing with impossibility, as well as in terms of public discussion problems in making a change in the world in which we actually live. These ideas and others are discussed in this book, Development is Freedom, winner of the 1998 Nobel Prize in Economics. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.